This morning is from John 12, verse 31 to 36. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. Father, we do thank you so much for all the wonderful things that you do for us. That it was your plan before time even existed as we know it to send the light to this world, to send Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Christ, our Redeemer, the name above all names, Lord. May we realize and truly believe in you, the love that you have for your children, the love that you would send your Son with the intention and purpose to die for our sins so that we could live a life that brings glory and honor to you. So that we don't have to rely on our own might or anything else, but we just need to die to ourselves so that we might live, so that there might be a harvest of souls. And we thank you that Jesus is at the right hand interceding for us, and that also the helper, the advocate, the Holy Spirit is with us and dwelling in us, making us a temple where you reside making us a group of priests, a holy priesthood called out to this world to bring the light of Christ to this world. We thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So I entitled this Chip Off the Old Block. Now I want to know something. How many do not know what Chip off the Old Block, off the old block means? Do the younger ones? Joy, do you know? Yeah. Okay. Because we think about it and we think, oh, we know these things and we say these things. And half the time I say something to Jacob like that, he'll be like, what are you talking about? Because <laughs> we don't necessarily carry these things down. But I want to especially stress that because the thing that we are called to do more than anything is to train up disciples to make disciples. And that comes first with our own family. So you might not have been here last week for a Father's Day message. But you're going to get one this week, for sure. I'm going to make a call out to you guys to make a stand, to continue to grow, to stand with each other firm in faith. And it's not coincidence that we're doing baby dedications the next week. And my dad will even be here. And you'll get to see the resemblance of, I guess, great-granddad. Whatever, I would be granddad. That's what I'm going to get to. You're... And then grandson, and then great-grandson. But see, it used to go like this, and now it's warped like this because 
my dad and I are de decreasing in size. So, but he should be here and he should get to see the baby dedication. And I didn't know that you were thinking about it, Joy. That blesses my heart as much as my own grandson. And to say that we're going to do these baby dedications is just purely saying praise to God. So I hope you can be here. And I'm sorry I didn't put it in the bulletin. I didn't, didn't know it was coming to be a reality. I knew it was talked about. I didn't even know Joy's was talked about. So we'll cook meat, you bring sides, and we'll celebrate. And like I said, my dad will be here. So if you got to be at the one's men's prayer breakfast when he was here, he told some nice stories, didn't he, guys? Yeah, they have a different view of me now, for sure, as I was growing up. <laughs> and I just want to praise God in all that we do. But what chip off the old block means, if you're not familiar, I looked it up just so I could get an, a true recollection of what it is, because so many times we think that we understand what something means, but we really don't understand what it means. It was originally chip off the old block instead of chip off of the old block. It's an expression that is used been, since, being used since the 1600s. It does not necessarily mean appearance. We seem to have gravitated to you look like your dad or whatever. It was written because you act and carry on the habits and traits of your father. And it was written about our heavenly father, that we carry his attributes and traits, that we are a chip off of that block, not a chip off the atom, but a chip off the new man, Jesus Christ, because he is like his father, because he is his father, and he teaches us to be like our heavenly father. He even says in Scripture to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we know that we can't do that, but we read on in Scripture, and, and we read and we see that, God, that Jesus said, it is better for me to go away and send the Spirit, because you can have this life that you never knew was possible if you'll just die to the Spirit. And as we see in John chapter 12 where we're at, that it's time to make that decision. And Jesus says, I'm going to die. And if you're willing to take up my cause, if you're willing to truly believe the theme of John, then you will follow after me even to death so that the Spirit can live through you so that there will be, not might be, but will be a harvest. Two baby dedications next week is a great harvest. Wow! Quit doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Receiving that award and knowing what the award was for was a, another wow. And you know, God has the perfect timing in when He gives those things to you too. It, it was a great time. One of the times that that writing was used was used by John Milton. And if you're not familiar with him, he used it in one of his works. But he also is known for Paradise Lost. And it starts out, Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with the loss of Eden till one greater man restore us. That's how much God loved us, that He would send His only Son to die for us so that we might truly live. I got my dad's Bible that I brought in today to remind me of my responsibility to my children, to my family, to my friends, that I am called to be like my Father in heaven to be a chip off of that block. Do you know God spoke three times in the New Testament? I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about God if you look at the recordings. I guess those words should be written in purple maybe instead of red, but if you, they're written in black in your Bibles. If you're not paying attention, you won't realize them. The first time that God spoke in the New Testament is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 
It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, as we're reading in John, we see one of the times when God spoke from heaven the third time. We'll get to that in a second. But Jesus says, this voice wasn't for me. It was for you. So that you would understand, that you would believe. So that you would know, in this case, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Spirit right here. That you would know that Jesus is the promised one that God spoke about. The one who would save their people from their sins. Because we can't do it on our own. We desperately, desperately need a Savior to restore us back to a right relationship with God. And as you're reading, you can see that we think about, oh, how it would have been to walk in the days walking with Jesus. But Jesus says it'd be better for you to walk with the Spirit every day because all of you then have the Spirit of God inside of you. That you can be everywhere united together for the cause instead of walking beside of me. We think about the Old Testament saints and the times of Israel and we say, well, how could they see these mighty wondrous works and and then fall away? But let us not look at that without learning and say we do the same thing. This is the age of the church, but so many times the church becomes a building rather than that congregation called out to the world to tell of the love of God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, empowered by the Spirit to do that walk, to show those good works, to die to yourself, to think of others' needs above yourself, to love even your enemies. Because the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. The next time that God the Father spoke from heaven was at His Son's transfiguration. Luke 9, 34 and 35 record this. While he, Peter, was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And Jesus tells us constantly, very, verily, I t- very, very, Verily, verily, thank you. I tell you, listen up. Those who have ears to hear, those who have eyes to see, listen to my words, because these are the words of God the Father spoken through the Son, given to you to bring them alive in you by the Spirit of God if you choose to believe, so that you can live out these words. So I think these two instances are definitely God speaking for our benefit rather than Jesus's. Luke account was written shortly after these words. You know, I like to go back just a little bit to read beforehand. That was Luke 9, verse 34 and 35. Well, if we back up to Luke 9, verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now if you notice it says, don't tell anybody yet. But in John 12 we are up to, uh, we're going to tell everybody now because my time has come. And what all you think I'm going to talk about, about restoring the the kingdom of Israel and, and our plans to overthrow this Roman conquering on our lands and everything, was instead a kernel of wheat must fall to the ground and die. Because he's saying, here's how we're going to do it. Here's how I'm going to save the world by dying so that you might live and tell others about the joy that you have. Continuing on verse 23, Then he said to them all, to everyone who had ears, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow after me. I think you've seen that somewhere before, except it was in Mark's account rather than Luke's. Whoever wants to be my disciple, do you want that? Do you believe that? Because if you do, you've been born again. The power of God lives inside of you and you just need to rely on that power to truly live so that your children will walk in the ways of righteousness. So that you're training up disciples to be disciples, to make a difference in this world. Verse 24, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Look at the irony in that. Do you really want to save your life? Then you have to give up this life, this way of thinking. 
You have to take yourself off the throne and put God on the throne where He always has been. You just didn't want to see it, didn't want to recognize it. Verse 25, For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world? All the things that the deceiver tells you will make you happy, make you satisfied, make you complete. You can look at Hollywood, you can look at sports figures, you can look at men of power and see that there's nothing in this world that will fill the need in your heart that Jesus Christ will fill. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world that has come into the world. But men loved their evil deeds and ran away, stayed in the darkness rather than letting the light expose their deeds and come to it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Words for our benefit from Jesus. Words to live by. Not cumbersome commands, but words of encouragement, words of life. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. He says that his sheep hear his voice. They don't listen to anyone else because everyone else is a thief and a robber. He comes to bring life and abundant life to you. So we're now we're back to John chapter 12. We'll actually probably be in another time or two before we leave John chapter 12. And I want to go back to verse 20 because this is kind of where this passage started. Where some Greeks had come to Jerusalem. They had come to see who this Jesus was. He had come into Jerusalem as Hosanna, King of kings, Lord of lords. They wanted to see for themselves the intellectual people of their time. Wise men from the west, right? Now rather than the east. I think I got that right in my head. They had come to Jerusalem to the Passover celebration. They paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida and Galilee. They said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Have you met Jesus? Do you know Him personally? Because even the demons know His name and shudder. But do you know Him personally? Are you a child of the Most High? Because you have believed in Jesus Christ and born of the Spirit. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and die, it remains alone. But, it, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And I'm in for NLT. I didn't tell, I think, right? I'm different? Yes. Okay, I'm in NLT. But that's all right. You can be reading that and listening and get both of the translation. Verse 25, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray? Father, save me from this hour. But this is the very reason I have come. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice came from heaven the third time. I have already brought glory to my name and will do it again. When the crowd heard the voice, some of them thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not for mine. That God will always bring glory and honor to his name. That that's why Jesus came, that's why Jesus would go to the cross. That's why Jesus would rise again and ascend to the Father and send the Holy Spirit back for those who chose to believe. And then, oh, wow, you get to be a part of that. It's a privilege and an honor, not a cumbersome cross to bear. The thing that becomes death, the image of the cross, becomes life, joy, and peace. And you get to participate in it by being like Christ, by being like your heavenly Father, by being a chip off of that block because you resemble God your Father because of Jesus Christ your Lord and the power of the Spirit that reigns in you. Then we get to our scripture that we read this morning. The time for judging this world has come. But yet Jesus said, I didn't come to, to judge the world in John 3. So he's not talking about that. He's talking about... 
time for the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men loved darkness rather than light? Or you love the light and you'll follow after the light and it'll change everything. And you will become the light of the world so that others may see. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. He won't have any power and dominion over you. You can pray to God the Father and He'll give you anything that you ask. You can pray that the devil leaves you alone and he will. Don't forget that. That's scriptural. It also says that with any temptation that is given you, there will, God will provide the way of escape. The devil has no power and dominion in your life. That was taken away at Calvary. Period. Jesus said, it is finished. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You can live an abundant life through the Spirit to be like your Father in heaven. Verse 32 says, And when I am lifted from the earth, up from the earth, I will draw everyone, anyone who chooses to believe, to myself. He's calling you. He's calling the whole world. And again, if you're obedient, you get to be part of that calling and drawing people to God. Wow. He said this to indicate how he was going to die that He was going to lay down His life. A new commandment I give you, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself, as Christ loved and gave Himself to restore you back to a right relationship with God, to join you together as a royal priesthood, a holy people, the church who is called out according to His purpose to bring Him glory and honor and draw other people home. Wow. If we go back to John chapter 10, we see that Jesus loves even those who don't love Him. We see it at the cross. He says at this point that He is the gate and the good shepherd. He is the only way. He told this so that they would understand these things and believe at this moment that this is the only way. He is the only way. Death is the only way to truly live. In John chapter 10, starting in verse 1, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, the reason I want to go back to this point is to show you, these were the people who everybody thought had it right in those days. If anybody was going to heaven, was going to inherit eternal life, it would be these people, the Pharisees. But Jesus called them hypocrites, which tells their true nature. They were actors playing a role on the stage. Their hearts were far from the truth. So very tr truly I tell you, listen up, you Pharisees. Anyone who does not enter, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Don't listen to Satan. Don't listen to his lies saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. God can't use you. He can, He wants to, He will use you to bring Him glory and honor. Whether you submit to His will or not, we just read that in Scripture. He has honored His name and will honor His name again. <clears throat> Verse 2, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to His voice. He calls His own sheep by name. Oh, but let's, let's do this. He calls his sheep by Alan. Go ahead, do it. You don't have to do it out loud, but put your name in there. Jesus calls you personally. Are you answering his call? Now, Polly said sheep were stupid last week. No offense on Polly. <laughs> because if you listen to most sermons, that's what they'll tell you. Sheep are stupid creatures and need... But sheep are very smart creatures right here in this passage. The reason they listen to their shepherd's voice is because anyone else is a thief and a robber and even a dumb sheep knows that. So sheep are smarter than you think. Okay, so whenever a pastor says sheep are dumb, you go right back to it and say sheep are smart. I am a sheep. I follow the voice of my shepherd. But don't say that if you don't mean it. Sheep need a shepherd. 
There's your key. They're not stupid or smart. They need a shepherd. And, oh, there's an and in there. Jesus, the true shepherd, leads them out to green pastures, to wonderful times, protection, everything else. Everything that that sheep needs, the shepherd lovingly provides. Verse 4, when he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them. Ah. Hebrews says to keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And finisher, I think, is in there too, right? And his sheep follow him because they know his voice intimately, lovingly. That's my shepherd, I follow him. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Pretty smart sheep. <laughs> Jesus used his figure of speech, but the Pharisees, oh, the ones that were religious, but pretenders, did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, as a result of these things that we've just said in Jesus' prior words there in verses 1 through 5, Jesus said again, listen up, verily, verily, I tell you, hello, I am the gate for the sheep. No other, I am. Do you need more clarification than that or is it pretty clear? I am the gate for the sheep. I call each and every one of you personally by your name. This was God's plan before time existed. He knitted and formed you in your mother's womb. He gave you the parents that He gave you. He is in supreme control of everything and uses it for His glory. So when you say, but, but this, but that, uh, I, I've experienced this in my life, how can you use it for God's glory? He called each and every one of you to be His sheep, to listen to the voice of the shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. He is the gate. But the sheep and the Pharisees have not listened to them. So it says again in verse 9, I am the gate. If Jesus says something twice, you better write it down. You better remember it. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Oh, there we are to John 12 when this time has come and I'm revealing this. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock is scattered. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So now we get another back-to-back -back I am statement right here in just a few verses. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. See that chip off the block? And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pens, the Greeks, the Gentiles, the rest of the world, those outside of Jerusalem who are in Judea, Samaria, and into the other ends of the earth. And I'm calling them out, and you get to be a part of this process of drawing them into the sheep pen so that they will be saved, that they may have eternal life. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now, I don't know if you call that in that last verse, but it says, I must bring them. Jesus is gone. And He must bring the rest of the fold into the pen. Now how's He going to do that if you're not obedient to His commands in the first place? If you want to give Him excuses of why He can't use you. If you're not obeying Him. Now see why I use John 10 to lead us to John 12 where he says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, now is the time for judgment. Now is the time for you to decide. Because in John 13, Jesus gets intimate again with those who have decided. And he says, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to really put myself humbled. You know, one of the things that I say to people a lot when they talk about the characteristics of Jesus. And I get love and compassion and everything. 
I always want to point out, and not because I necessarily think it's the greatest attribute, because I don't rate them. They're, they're great attributes. But humbleness, humility. Jesus would have never came to this earth, would have never laid down His life, if He didn't humble Himself below every single one of us. Every single rotten scoundrel ever born. Jesus died for their sins. And He's called us to lay down our lives so that we can have a productive life for Him. And in that process, we get peace, joy, tranquility. We get rewards. The plaque is one thing. Baby dedications are greater. When we're in heaven and somebody walks up to you and says... I'm here because of you. I don't see anything that could be any greater than that. So I'll follow the voice of my shepherd. Back to John chapter 12. The time for judging this world has come. When Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowd responded. What is their response then? We understood from scriptures that the Messiah would live forever. We, don't, we think we know the answers. Does it matter that we have all the answers? Or that we follow the one who has all the answers. The one who is the gate. The true shepherd. The way, the truth, and the life. Jesus replied. And then they say, just who is this son of man anyway? Jesus replied, my light I am the light of the world. Debbie, now do you know why you picked that for an opening verse? I am the light of the world. My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can. Why? So the darkness will not overtake you. The longer you're disobedient to God, the further you're going away from Him. You might have salvation, but you're never going to live the life that He intended you to live. You're not going to be following after Jesus. You're not going to experience true reward if, in fact, the Spirit resides in you. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they're going. Put your trust, and you could put believe in there. Put your trust in the light while there is still time then what? You will become children of light. Wow. What a promise. And to know that we don't have to do it on our own, that God does it for us. He has done it before you were born. He'll do it all the way till you're with Him with glory, in glory for all eternity. That statement reminds me of John chapter 8 and verse 12 and 13. When Jesus spoke again to the people, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Verse 13 though, the Pharisees, <laughs> coincidence, they show up here again, right? They challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Oh, we can go back to John chapter 12 now, can't we? When a voice from heaven cried out, I believe that's testimony enough, is it not? God Himself testified, This is my Son. I am well pleased. This is my Son. Listen to Him. I will glorify my I have glorified my name, and I will continue to glorify it. This voice was not for Jesus' benefit, but for yours, so that you could understand that nothing should hold you back from living a life of light, of truth, of worth of following in the footsteps of Jesus. So that's why Jesus cried out in verse 35, My light will shine for you just a little longer. In John chapter 12, Walk in the light while you can, so that darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. They are headed for destruction, eternal destruction eternally away from their Father in heaven who loves them so much. 
Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they're going. So, instead, but put your trust in the light while you still can. And here's a promise that comes from, from Jesus, comes from God. You will become children of light. Wow. Jesus poured out His love, His mercy, and His grace so that you would come to the Father so that you could live. I told you I've been studying Luke a little bit, which made me preach in John. <laughs> so now I'm back to Luke. So I'm skipping the John one, Diana, just so you know. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around Him and listening to the Word of God. This is the whole people of the countryside listening because we're longing to know how we can have eternal life. If this is the Messiah, the one that John the Baptist foretold about. Hearers of the word, for sure, but not necessarily doers. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Now maybe you don't understand what that means, but that means they were done with work for today. They were putting everything up. They were ready to go home and get in the easy chair and relax. Okay? Verse 3, Jesus got into one of the boats. <laughs> what is Jesus doing here? The one belonging to Simon. And he asked him to put out a little from shore. Well, that's not too bad. I thought I was done with today, but Jesus is just asking me to put out a little bit. I got a little bit of energy still left in me for today. Then Jesus sat down and he taught the people from the boat. You know, he's teaching me at the same time that you're getting him involved, letting you teach people. If you don't believe that, start serving and watch how much that the Spirit opens up your heart and mind and scriptures and everything because you're willing to teach others and the fulfillment that you'll get from that. So Jesus got into the boat. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, give me even more. Isn't that what he says? Put in, out into deep water. It means i got to go a little farther Got to go a little further out. Got to have a little more work. Got a little more work. Come back in. I thought my day was over. But Jesus asked me if he could get in the boat. And he asked me to give him a little bit. Now he wants me to give him a little bit more. What am I going to do? Simon answered, Master, because you are my master, what you're telling me to do, I'm going to listen. But I'm going to give you a little excuse here. We worked hard all night. And we haven't caught anything. Because I assume you're asking us to put out in the boat, even though you were talking to people already preaching that you want us to catch fish. I don't even see the real intent and purpose here. Oh, wait a minute. Before, I think I heard something about fishers of men, but we'll get to that here in a minute, won't we? But, complete opposite of what I've said, even though I've whined about it, complained about it, because you say so. So if that has to be your motivation alone, read Scripture and ask to yourself, what is it saying to me? I will let down the nets. I will. I will no matter if anybody else follows me or sees what's going on or not. I will be obedient to what you're saying because you are my master. I believe in you. I believe that you're the Son of God that came to save the world from their sins. Verse 6. When they, up oh, other men followed. Here's your sermon illustration for you men today. Okay? Other men followed. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Oh, wait a minute. They fished all night long. They were putting up their nets. They had to go out into deeper water, which means that those nets were even deeper down, which were getting even more effort to pull them back up. They caught such a large number that their nets began to break. An amazing harvest. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Oh, wait a minute. One man standing up for God, other men followed, and even more men followed. See the pattern, guys? And they came. They were obedient to their master. Maybe it took seeing this catch for them to get obedient, but they still were obedient. More and more followed. This movement went along. This movement called the church, which is called out to tell people about Jesus Christ so that they can be gathered into 
His pen and saved for all eternity. And they filled both boats, not just the nets are going to break now, but so that the boats began to sink. Now I want you to notice what's not recorded in Scripture here. Sometimes you want to do that. Not one of them said, Well, wait a minute, the boats are sinking. They were so focused and fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith, that they didn't care if they were going to drown to death. They said, Look at this catch. Even if I have to fall as a kernel of wheat to the ground and die, the harvest is worth it. Come on, guys. Verse 8, when Simon, Peter, wait a minute, before it just said Simon, didn't it? Now Luke intentionally writes Simon Peter. Peter whose name was changed by Jesus because he would be the rock, the starter of the church, that they didn't even know was starting back here before we ever get to Luke writing Acts and the work of the Holy Spirit involved in this. This is before the Pentecost. <clears throat> when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. Not literally go away, but he's so humbled because I'm a sinner, sinful man. Verse 9, For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. They will see your good works, your good deeds, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were some key men. Ah, because I stood up, there'll be some more key men that stand up also. So were James and John and, and the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Godly men. People that were brothers of Jesus Christ because they followed Him. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. To Simon, don't be afraid because you're Peter now. Don't have these fears and doubts anymore because there's a time coming in John chapter 12 when the prince of this world, the ruler of this world who God has given authority to, his authority will end with me, with my obedience of coming to the cross to die for you so that you could live. Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore they left everything and they followed Him. That's what believing means. We water it down so much. I got to talk to somebody week before last about that. And I said, you understand what this believing means? That you have to read the Bible all the way up to this point to see that we need a Savior, to see that, that God promised that He would send one, that John cried out in the wilderness after a period of drought of not hearing from God at all and said, He is here now. Jesus, this is the one. And a voice from heaven cried out and said, This is the one. A voice from heaven cried out again and said, Listen to Him. And then a voice cried out from heaven again here in John chapter 12 and said, I will glorify my name. I have glorified it. I will continue to glorify it. It's all about glorifying God. And you can follow along with that or not. But He's still going to bring Him glory and honor and He still created you. And He still sent His Son to die for you so that you could live. In John chapter 5, verse 35, John the Baptist was a lamp that burned and gave light. And you chose for a time to enjoy this light. I have testimony weightier than John, for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard this voice nor seen his form. <laughs> now they hear his voice even. Nor does His Word dwell in you, for you do not believe. You don't forsake all, trusting in me and only me and following after me. You're holding on to the things of this world instead of denying yourself daily, taking up your cross and following after me. Taking up your cross, your symbol of torment and pain, because you think that's what it is. The world thinks that's what it is. They think it's foolishness. But really it's the power of salvation whereby men might be saved. 
if you believe and put your trust in this. Verse 39, you study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come and not have light, but have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you, I know that you do not have the love of God in your heart. I have come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you have accepted glory from another? But do not seek the glory that comes from but do not seek the glory that comes from only God. Are you seeking his glory? Or are you still listening to the lies and deceptions of the one who was, who was given authority in your life? But not anymore if you've believed and are born again. Verse 45, But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say. The time for judgment come in John chapter 12. The time has come for judgment for you men and for you ladies. Will you follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ? Will you put your faith and trust in Him? <laughs> we got a baby dedication, couple baby dedications next week because their parents are making that claim. And when they do that, if you're not familiar with what a baby dedication is, and I'll go further about it, that also says that you and I, as brothers and sisters, as family, will help them, not point fingers at them, but help them. You have gifts the Spirit has given you that they don't have to help. You can pray. We can be tied together with the unity of the Spirit, or we can fear and let Satan bring discord and rebellion into our lives and not follow after the true light, the voice of our true shepherd. So men, I didn't have all the Father's Day presents last week. That's because Amazon Prime wasn't so prime. <laughs> However, I didn't know in my time that that was the case, that this was God's plan for you to get it this week. See? It's where we walk by faith. And this plaque is from Proverbs 27. It says, The righteous man walks in his integrity. And what? A promise after that. His children are blessed after him. A chip off the old block. Now, like I said, I didn't plan that. The sermon came Monday because Sherry said, get the sermon written because my birthday's later this week. <laughs> Send it out. I didn't know these were going to make it in. They came in this week. I looked at Amazon later. All this is God putting together, asking you now because the time of judgment has come. Seriously, will you follow after Him? Not going to be easy. That's why it's called a cross. But you've got other men and women here that will help you that will follow after you, that when they start seeing the catch, that they'll get even more excited. That maybe next year's plaque will, will be the best church in the 150 to 250 range. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where God's calling us. And I don't have to know those answers. I just have to walk in Christ's footsteps. So here's what I'm going to say. All men that are willing to come take this plaque, Jacob, come on up here. Come and receive this plaque, and then if you will, you don't have to, stand with us to sing our closing song. It's called The Stand. And I think it would be a blessing for your families to see you do that. Okay? Now, if you don't want to stand, go back to your seat, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to, but please come all men and receive this gift from the church to show you that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. God is sovereign, and He wants you to be His obedient child. So men, come on. You weren't ready for that, were you? Somebody's got to get up first. Come on, Mike. <laughs>
If you got your plaque last week, because a few guys did, 